Coming up on this week's show, Tammy Middleton joins us to tell us all about the release of her revamped series, Tales from the Sound. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 231 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamsrights.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and husband, Will Knaus. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable community on Patreon. A big thanks to Regina for their pledge. We'll have more information on how you can join the community at the end of the show, along with a sneak peek of what we have coming up for you next week. Thank you, everybody. Welcome back to another great show. We've got some news to share. Take it away, Jeff. I always want a teletype sound for that, (laughs) but there just isn't one available. Anyway, yes, news. I am excited to announce that I have a new book. Ta-da! It's been a while since I've been able to, to talk about that, but just yesterday on Sunday, March 8th, I did a cover reveal Uh, for a new series that I am working on alongside some other great authors. I am so excited to be in a shared universe with R.J. Scott, V.L. Losey, Susan Scott Shelley, and Chantel Murr. You can imagine with those authors that we're talking some hockey here, and we have unveiled the Hockey Allies Bachelor Bid series. And in particular, I got to reveal the cover for my book in that called Keeping Kyle. Now, you may ask, what the heck is this Hockey Allies Bachelor Bid Series? Here's our, our description. Hot hockey players on the auction block. Win a date with a professional hockey player during All-Star Weekend in Chicago. From leading scorers to fan favorites to guys you love to hate, watch the players strut their stuff in support of the Hockey Allies charity. Place a bid. You might just find someone to keep you warm. One night, one bid, one hockey bachelor auction could change everything. So those books are going to be coming out April 7th. There'll be a pre-order on March 31st, and they're going to head into Kindle Unlimited on Tuesday, April 14th. I've got the link to my cover reveal in the show notes, and from there you can link up to all the others. And of course, you can just find it also at jeffadamsrights.com. Congratulations. I know it's been a while for a new release for you, uh, and I'm looking forward to reading this one. Yeah, this is one that Will hasn't read yet, and he's actually going to get a sneaky peek of that next week. So hopefully he'll like it, because he'll be the first full read outside my editor. Some other news this week. We joined forces with Adriana Herrera and Annabeth Albert to help raise money for pro-literacy. Now, some of you may recognize this, because each summer for many years, RWA, Readers for Life Autographing, actually raised money for this same charity. And this year, because many aren't going to be attending that, our group has taken a cue from Beverly Jenkins and Tessa Dare to help raise money for this amazing cause. Now, the queer romance community is, of course, a diverse, robust, and very driven part of Romance Landia. And we're really hoping you join us on this cause. Every person who donates at least $5 will be entered to win a couple of signed copies from one of the authors participating. And if you donate $10 or more, you're going to be entered to receive a signed set of Adriana Herrera's Dreamer series or a set of Frozen Hearts books from Annabeth Albert. E.J. Russell and Jackie North have also donated books for the giveaway. And we do want to mention, if you're an author who wants to donate books for this, you can simply get in touch with Adriana via Facebook or Twitter. We're looking to raise at least $2,000 by the end of July. And in just the first few days since we've announced this, we're already over $500, so we're already well on our way to 2000 and it would be great to blow past that amount. The link for all the information and how to donate is in the show notes. So we really hope you can donate to this great cause, and we thank you for any support that you can give. So it's that time of the year again. Spring is just about sprung. I don't know how it's going where you're living, but uh, the trees are in bloom here. Uh, I'm going to start sneezing real hard real soon. My point being that spring isn't usually the season where you think about watching new TV series, but Jeff and I wanted to share some of the shows that we've been watching recently and thought you might want to know about. The first is something you may have come across in your news feed on whatever social media platform you prefer. Netflix recently premiered the Spanish series Toy Boy. 
this is essentially the hot stripper show. <laughs> so <laughs> that could just be its subtitle, Toy Boy, the hot stripper show. So in deference to you, our valued listeners, we decided to give it a try to see if it was worth your time. And our initial feelings are, yes, it is very much worth your time. Not only is it, of course, a beautiful looking show, it's also really intriguing. The series focuses on a guy named Hugo, a former male stripper who was jailed for a crime he did not commit. He is now out on parole and looking to clear his name. Uh, And that's where the story takes off and it takes some really interesting twists and turns It's far more engaging than I thought it would be. Of note, one of Hugo's friends is Hyro. He is essentially the hot mute stripper. He also does some gay for pay escorting on the side. And during the series, he strikes up a friendship with Andrea, the emotionally troubled son of the woman Hugo was seeing uh, before he went to jail for purportedly killing her husband. It's all very complex and twisty and really fascinating. I'm enjoying this series so much. We're only five episodes in, but so much has gone down, and I am loving every second of it. I am too. It's a ridiculously smart series, uh, and I really hope that with all the complexities that they keep putting in, because it just keeps every episode a new piece of this whatever's happening conspiracy or mystery or whatever you want to call it clicks and it's like wait who, what that no way <laughs> i'm really intrigued too with this storyline with hyro it was only mere minutes after i actually said as we were watching i think it was episode two i'd like to know more about that guy then we were suddenly getting much more on that guy as he started this relationship i love it i'm so glad you kind of brought it into our into our watching list and i can't wait to see how the remaining episodes go. And please, please, please finish the show as strong as it started. I really want it to keep up its its great pace. When I did a quick internet search about the show, I learned that the lead actor, Jesus Mosquera, who plays Hugo, was actually a former pro soccer player who was discovered by a producer and underwent not only a strict workout regimen, but took a lot of acting classes as well. Not only is he gorgeous, of course, but I think he's actually really compelling. Everyone in the show is actually, number one, really beautiful, but also really interesting. Yeah, they're all performing this show really well, and they're they're giving it the dramatic weight that it's due. This could easily slip into some kind of melodrama or something. And this is this is hardcore mystery suspense going on here with just this nice other stripper level to it. It's it's not heightened telenovela Mm -hmm. camp. It is much more serious thriller territory that we're wading into, and I can't wait to get even deeper into the show. So will Hugo find justice, and will Jairo and Andrea become more than friends? We're going to definitely keep benching to find out. Yes. Another show that we've been enjoying is Good Trouble. We've spoken about this show on the past. It's currently airing on Freeform. It recently wrapped up its second season and it will be returning this summer i really enjoyed it i can't recommend it enough my favorite character gael i don't think he kissed nearly enough cute boys this season (laughs) but one of the funniest episodes i thought in all of season two was when he took some magic mushrooms and attempted the finale lift from dirty dancing and ended up breaking his wrist (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious. Poor and, guy. Yeah. <laughs> that whole episode with the magic mushrooms was a hoot. As always happens, Good Trouble plays with nonlinear storytelling, which to me only heightens the way that everything happens on this show. And that was certainly one of those moments. Something else that I'm enjoying far more than I ever thought I would is Katie Keene. It's still going strong. This Riverdale spinoff is charming and funny and very heartfelt. And I find that I genuinely care about these characters, even though some of the situations they find themselves in are a little bit silly and kind of candy colored. But I think what this particular cast brings to the show is a certain genuine authenticity that makes you care for them. 
Yeah, I, I have also really continued to enjoy this show since we started it. And you're right, they're authentic and they try to have a good outlook on life, even though life isn't always treating them in the best way. But their bubbly outlook is good, and God knows we could all use some bubbly outlook right now. Definitely bubbly was in a recent episode. The cast just happened to sing a song from Aida which uh, is personally my favorite Elton John Broadway show. So it's kind of a little bit ridiculous, a little bit heartfelt. I really enjoy Katie Keene. If you'd like to know more about that, you can check it out on the CW app. If you'd like to watch Good Trouble, season two is currently on Hulu. And if you want to know more about Boy Toy, it is currently available for binge watching on Netflix. In the hockey player's heart, the feel-good gay romance by Jeff Adams and Will Knauss, hockey star Caleb Carter returns to his hometown to recover from an injury. He never expects to run into his one-time crush at a great school fundraiser. Seeing Aaron Price hits him hard, like being checked into the boards. The attraction is still there, even after all these years, and Caleb decides to make a play for the school teacher. You miss 100% of the shots you never take, right? Aaron has been burned by love before, and can't imagine what a celebrity like Caleb could possibly see in a guy like him. Their differences are just too great. But as Aaron spends more time with Caleb, he begins to wonder if he might have what it takes to win the hockey player's heart. Get the hockey player's heart at Amazon.com. So first up in books this week, I'm going to fanboy over Zio Axelrod a little bit more, as if I haven't already done that enough. If you heard my interview with Zio in episode 229, you know I was already loving Frankie and Johnny Let the Music Play. And as I finished the book, my enjoyment did not diminish. I absolutely adore these two. Let the Music Play picks up shortly after that first book ended. Frankie and Johnny are together and feeling out their relationship and their place in each other's lives. We open with Johnny visiting Frankie at the radio station where Frankie works. Johnny likes hanging out during the overnight shift, and Frankie's very into it too, even though Johnny is a major distraction as they tend to make out, which can cause Frankie to miss some of his cues. I cannot tell you how cute this is. We've talked about how into music Frankie is and that he doesn't want to put the station on autopilot He wants to run that show himself, and yet when Johnny's around, he can easily start to miss things that are happening around him, and the flustered that he gets is ridiculously awesome. These two finally go out on an actual date, and they actually put the label on it. They've been going out and hanging out, but they go on a date, and for Johnny, this is the first time that he's dated a man, and hearing Johnny call Frankie his date That nearly unhinges Frankie because he realizes how very important that is. Now, this newly dating a man thing might actually be more than Johnny can handle. We know from the previous book that there's a lot going on with him, far more than he's told Frankie to this point. After their wonderful date, they talk more about what it means to be a couple and how Johnny, for the first time, is embracing who he really is. And that includes talking about the man he became friends with back when he was still teaching in school in a small conservative town. Frankie knows there's more here than he's actually being told, but he doesn't press too hard either at this point. Johnny's had such a complicated life, and Frankie does all he can to take that in. And also understanding the fact that he's actually going to be the first man that Johnny is with because he didn't do anything with that man he became friends with. Many other talks about the past happen in this too, as well as Frankie giving the story about why he and his ex Garrett actually broke up. And all of this just helps cement these two men closer together. Now, as Frankie and Johnny prepare for a big trip to a record show so that Frankie could pick up some vinyl, They get some homophobic slurs thrown out at them on the street, and that freaks Johnny out. While Frankie is shrugging this off, he can't quite figure out why it's hit Johnny so hard, and it kind of casts a a cloud over their day. But they end up spending the rest of the weekend together, and, and this is their first time to stay together for an entire weekend. And they do it at Johnny's place. And let's just say there's a lot of sexy times going on here. And boy, does Zio write some sizzling sex scenes. My goodness. And it's only amped up by the fact that Frankie is so incredibly sweet and passionate and hot as he introduces Johnny to things that he's never done before. And all this is made sweeter and really, you know, ramps up the hotness 
because of the sexy shower after everything has happened. Now, unfortunately, shortly after the sexy times, Johnny gets a call and he has to go, leaving Frankie alone at his place. No longer satisfied with not knowing why Johnny sometimes shuts down and disappears, he takes to Google and does some detective work, and for better or worse, finds every sordid detail about Johnny and his past. I could have never conceived what was lurking in that past either, and neither, frankly, neither could Frankie. Zio has spun a pretty incredible dark turn here, and I had all the feels for Frankie as he kind of retreated to sort everything out about what he'd learned. And he got some help from some good friends too, not just Dyer, who he talks to a lot, but he even went back to his ex Garrett because they were already trying to stay friends. Frankie and Johnny's resolution to achieve their HEA was incredibly satisfying. There's so much that goes on here, and I'm just not going to spoil it because you need to take this journey with the characters just like I did. Suffice to say, everything that went down here really ticked so many boxes for me. Zio mentioned in our interview that we've got Dyer's story yet to come, and I'm so looking forward to that so we can get back into this universe. If you haven't read the two Frankie and Johnny books, I highly recommend that you add them to your TBR. So up next, we've actually got a double feature review. We've got a couple books by K.M. Newhold, and you're going to start us off with her latest one. Her latest book is called Cocky. Let me just say before he gets too into this, this is like my, one of my most favorite covers in recent times. The cover is ridiculously hot, and I hope that the book matches the heat of the cover. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Oh, um, good. <laughs> so Cocky is indeed super duper sexy. It focuses on a guy named Ren, who has just gotten out of a long-term relationship, is looking to uh, shake things up. So he goes out on the town with his best friend, they go to the nearest gay bar, and he's looking to get back on the proverbial horse. Or in this particular case, it's a hot muscle bear, a guy named Cole. And they hook up for the evening, and it is amazing. Although, the next day, Cole ends up being the contractor that Ren has hired to remodel his kitchen. After a slightly awkward beginning, they become friends, with benefits, <laughs> While at the same time, they end up corresponding via an online app. Now, this is a traditional romantic setup that we've seen many times before, primarily in classics like Shop Around the Corner or the Judy Garland movie in the good old summertime, or probably, as most of you might remember, in You Got Mail, where our two characters interact in one capacity during the daytime and then at night unknowingly correspond with one another but in this case it's reversed during the day they have an emotional and funny text correspondence but at night things get a whole lot hotter with their friends with benefits situation our two main characters continue on going pretty hot and heavy till about the midpoint of the book where ren really starts to catch feelings for cole uh, and he decides to put the brakes on his relationship with his contractor. So he ends up pouring his heart out to his friend that he's been texting to, and they finally decide to meet, and then discover that they've known each other in this capacity all along. And it's not particularly awkward. It's at this point that the book takes a kind of a sweet turn, where our two main characters decide to actually start going out on dates and kind of integrate the ways that they know each other, the sort of hot and heavy carnal way and the friendly, emotionally supportive way. And the rest of the book is about bringing those two sides of their relationships together. Cole eventually comes to realize that Ren is not just a one night stand. He is worthy of trust and someone building a long-term relationship with, while at the same time, Ren, who is also a part-time beekeeper, realizes that Cole is the kind of guy who's going to stick around for the long term, primarily because he's a nice guy, but also because he does things like build a shed out in the back so he can put all of his beekeeping supplies away nice and tidily. It's really cute and it's charming. Our two main characters are adorable and really kind, funny, interesting the only critique I might have of the book is that the narrative uses alternating first-person viewpoint, but it does it in the present tense, which is not my favorite thing. I think longtime listeners will know I have very strong opinions about this. Very, very strong. <laughs> 
But the author, K.M. Newhall, pulls it off with flair and panache. Uh, Ren and Cole are really likable main characters, and I enjoy this book an awful lot. As well as a lot of other people, this book hit it out of the park when it when it was released a few weeks ago, and it is still riding high on the bestseller lists. So if you haven't given Cocky by K.M. Newell to try, I highly recommend that you do. The first thing that I thought of when you gave the name Ren is I immediately went to Footloose and I wanted somebody to have a dance in your book. I guess that didn't really happen, though, did it? <laughs> They had a really sweet slow dance at the in a bar at one point. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> My brain works in crazy ways sometimes. So I read K.M. Newhold's Rocket Science, which is a recent book that also sat atop the bestseller charts for quite a while. And I completely understand why. Now, I've been on a bit of a K.M. Newhold kick lately. This is my third one in the past few months. And I think... This one was so amazing, and it made me swoon so hard that I think this one is now my top favorite of KMs. Pax and Elijah, oh my god, I got so pulled into their story so quick. (laughs) Elijah was the perfect nerdy, geeky grad student, and Pax was the perfect workaholic kind of guy who would hook up with anyone, but who was also truly ready at his core to settle down. The fact that these two already knew each other from the past only made this whole thing work out just all the better. Now, as the book opens, we meet Pax as he's about to approach, you know, a potential hookup. And his younger brother kind of cock blocks him because he calls to see if Pax will look out for his best friend, Elijah, who has just moved out to LA for grad school. Theo's worried that his socially awkward friend isn't going to get out of his apartment or and make much of a life for himself outside of campus. So he asks his brother Pax to check up on him. And Pax reluctantly agrees, actually saving Elijah's number into his phone as Einstein, which is the nickname that he'd had for Elijah back in the day. Now, Elijah indeed has thrown himself directly into school, preparing for classes that have not even started yet, when Theo calls him to tell him that Pax will be in touch. He's not exactly looking forward to this, but he does remember his teen crush on Pax, Now, Theo has no idea what he has set into motion here. Their first meeting is everything you'd want in a meet-cute, or in this case, kind of a re-meet-cute. This is not really a second chances story because Pax wasn't all that into Elijah, you know, his younger brother's geeky friend back in the day. And Elijah's crush was certainly unrequited and never expected to be. Pax is not in any way prepared for the adult that greets him. At first, he's not even recognizing Elijah for the nerdlet he remembers, and he does refer to him as the nerdlet quite often. Pax thinks this guy's approaching him for a hookup, until the introduction actually happens, and then both guys are kind of stunned. Elijah is his usual reserved, bit awkward self, and he's actually not sure if Pax is making fun of him sometimes, or what exactly is happening around him, because he's just not that good at social cues. And what's even cuter as the night goes on, Elijah gets a little bit drunk, and after Pax helps him home, he actually returns the next morning to help Elijah over the hangover that he knows is coming. From here, it's a slow but sure progression as Pax wants to spend more time with Elijah, and even finds himself questioning the way he lives his life with all the travel and hookups that he's doing, because maybe there is something more. Now, Elijah finds a life outside of school, too, Theo has helped him navigate high school and undergrad, but it's Pax who shows him even more as they not only go out and meet Pax's friends, but they also have plenty of alone time together where they talk about everything from Star Wars to their lives and just about everything in between. KM takes what could be dull conversational times and really turns it into its own brand of flirting, and it is so swooningly spectacular. Now, it's not, of course, smooth sailing. Neither guy feels like they're right for the other. There's bits of self-sabotaging that goes on, and that's kind of both adorable and sad that it happens, and, and sad in a, oh, I want to pat you on your head and make it better kind of way. One of the cutest things of all is when Pax teaches Elijah to flirt, even though this is not really what either of them wants. And it's all the more hilarious because all of this means is that they end up and flirt with each other more. Pax takes the teaching a step beyond, too, as they end up in bed together. In the aftermath of that, Pax actually leaves Elijah asleep 
But then he realizes it was a really dick move and ends up and calls him the next morning to meet up for pancakes. Yes, it sounds a bit weird, but it just shows how drawn to each other these guys are. I can't properly describe how the push and pull is so wonderfully played out. I eagerly kept reading to see not only how Pax and Elijah would keep up this dance, but of course how they would ultimately arrive at that happy ever after too. Kayan pulled me into the story and just would not let me go. Two centerpieces of this story revolve around the holidays. Theo throws a wrench into Thanksgiving when he comes to L.A. And of course, neither Elijah or Pax have told Theo that they're having a relationship, so they have to try to force themselves into being just friends at this point, which is extremely difficult. And this includes Elijah ending up in a hilarious attempt at speed dating, which Pax witnesses making him into one super jealous guy who might just want to move things to the next level Maybe, but he's not quite sure still. And all this escalates all the more when they're home for Christmas together, still trying to keep secrets while they're around family. Of course, everything becomes too much. KM puts these guys through a difficult but yet extremely smart bit of black moment as they end up pulling back from each other. It's all perfectly angsty, but all at the same time, it wasn't one of those where I was screaming at the book for the guys to get their act together either. If anything, it was one of those where I actually wondered if they'd really make it or not. Of course they do, and of course I knew they would, but KM just worked some great magic here. And how she did it just made me spoon all the more for Pax and Elijah. Rocket Science was wonderful, and I look forward to what KM brings out next in the Love Logic series. She's already announced Four Letter Word, which will be an MMMM book. Yes, you heard four M's there. I haven't seen a date for it yet, but I cannot wait for it. If you're interested in learning more about these books or anything else that we've talked about on this week's show, all you have to do is go to the show notes page for episode 231 at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. Want to hang out with us between shows? Check us out on Facebook. You never know what we might post. News about book sales, bonus video content, and maybe even a live broadcast or two. Like us today at Facebook.com slash BigGayFictionPodcast and see what we get up to next. So recently I sat down with Tammy Middleton, who writes under the name T.M. Smith. She's been working to revamp what we once knew as the Alcock series and is re-releasing it as Stories from the Sound. So we're going to find out all about that and some other projects that she's working on. Tammy, welcome back to the podcast. It is so good to have you here. It's good to be here. We figured out just as we started recording that it has been exactly 100 episodes since you were here last because you were here in 131. I know. That's amazing. I like that. I like that. That, that century mark. Yes. So you're here today to tell us about the the relaunch of the Alcock series, and it's going to shift over now to be called Stories from the Sound. Yes. Tell us all about what's happening with this. I've seen the, the incredibly sexy cover for the first book, so I'm excited yep. to hear about all the plans. Yes, I'm going back, and of course, I started with book one, Gay for Pay. So the series title has changed, Stories from the Sound, and anyone that's read the books would, would realize why, because that the the lake, the river, whatever it is, it plays heavily into the stories. So I'm going back and rewriting. The first book is really going through a lot of changes. My editor and I are realizing more and more as we go through it. This book is, I would probably say, half of it has changed. So much more new content, just things that I did back then, little ticks and, and repetition and things that we're changing now that we're like six years in. And her and I both are so much uh, better with our, our, our crafts, her editing and my writing. You know, so I'm going to go back in and redo each one and add some new content and just bring these characters back to life. Hopefully pull in some new readers. So I'm excited. And there's going to be a new book releasing almost every month. The first three books are going to release one month apart starting April the 1st for Gay for Pay. And then you'll have three months and then it pushes out to six weeks from there for the books. So pretty much every four to six weeks for the rest of the year, the re-releases are going to come out. And for each book, the pre-order for the new book will be in the back of that book. So 
you'll be able to just click on that and have that other one ready for you when it when it releases. For those who it'll be new for, tell us what this series was about and specifically what we get to what we get to read in Gay for Pay. Oh my, yeah, it's been forever ago, and that makes me think about Sandrine. Um, so Gay for Pay was born from a conversation that I had at the first GRL I went to in Chicago, I think it was. So it was me and Sandrine and a couple of her models, Jordan and Caleb, and we were having conversations over drinks, so they definitely evolved into inappropriate. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the questions that I had asked them, you know, after I, it's, it had been a couple of years since I had been writing, and you know, so I asked Jordan and Caleb, you know, so what are you straight or are you bi? And so Jordan's like, well, I'm straight. So we got into the long, drawn out conversation of how that works. And if you want to know how that works, you have to read the book. <laughs> because there are literally three or four different conversations in the book that I had with him. So that's how the whole series was, was born. And it was actually only supposed to be one book. I was just going to do the one and done. But as soon as the book released, reviewers started emailing me and asking, well, what about these guys that run this online porn company? I want their story. And what about this one guy over here that's a total asshole, Corey? I want his story. You know, so one book became two and two became three. And now we're at seven books and starting over and cleaning them up. And there's going to be nine books total. So there's two more new ones coming at the end of the at the end of this year and the beginning of next year. What's it been like revisiting these books after the six and seven years since you first wrote them? Oh, yeah. The first when I first started going back over Gay for Pay and reading over everything and cleaning all that up. Again, I was I was reminded a lot of Sandrine. So early on, it was very tearful. She was very um, instrumental in me even beginning as a writer because I was just throwing things on a page and her and I were friends online. And so I started sending things to her. So going back and starting over with Gay for Pay was revisiting that relationship and then remembering that loss. So that was kind of hard. But the rest of it is amazing. Just I'll look at some things that I've written and um as an author, maybe you've done this too. When you go back and look at things and you're like, Oh my God, this is horrible. Why did anybody buy this? <laughs> you know, yeah, so, yeah, I've been there. Yes. So getting to go back now, later, whenever I've grown so much as an author and learned so many things to, to get to go back and really flesh these characters out even more and give them more depth to their story. It, it's, it's amazing and it's fun and I, I'm excited to see what the readers think about it when it re-releases. How fundamental would you say the stories have changed? Obviously it's a romance, so everybody's still going to get to yes. their HEA, but is it yes. just adding to that or have you changed character trajectories or how's that worked? So far I haven't changed any character trajectories. With this book in particular, I would say the bones of the story are still the same. That's not changing. You know, what Chris dealt with in his past and how he came to find the, these men and go to work for Alcox and everything that happened after that, that all stayed the same. But it was more like it, when I first wrote that book, I wasn't as good with putting the emotions that I was seeing the characters feeling in my head on paper. So it was more like wooden, one dimensional. So now being able to go back and really pour that emotion onto paper, uh, I think that it has just made it, made it even more realistic and mm -hmm. made the characters even more lovable. So we'll see. Tell us the characters we're meeting in Gay for Pay and, and what the gist of their story is as we meet them on the page. So the first one, that is Chris. So he is, he's a former football star from his little Alabama hometown, and he makes a really bad choice that has irrevocable consequences. And 
ruins some lives, and he winds up in New York with his best friend who's going to college. And then down on his luck, he runs across a flyer for Alcox one day where they're calling for models. And he decides, you know what? Nobody wants to hire me for a job because I have a felony on my record. He goes in, and there you go. He meets this group of men. They're all different. They're all unique. They're all fun and lovable and crazy. And he basically finds the family that he lost and falls in love. You make it sound so simple. <laughs> <laughs> if only. <laughs> what has surprised you the most in, in revisiting the series in general as you've been rewriting and updating? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if I would say surprised, but... So I went back in when I wrote the the first book was solely from Chris's perspective. Everything was you're mostly seeing it from his eyes, what he's seeing. So when I went back in, I decided that I wanted to put his love interest link in there. He's not in there a lot because I didn't want to change the book that drastically. So but he has I think I added two or three chapters for him. So it was it was nice and maybe a little bit surprising to get in there and you start writing these chapters and then the character takes on a life of his own. So that was fun. That was fun to get into. Did you have a hard time keeping Link constrained to just two or three chapters or did he push Actually, you to give yes. him some more? Yes. Well, no, what I did was <laughs> in the middle of a couple of other chapters – in my head, while I'm writing, I changed POV. So, of course, the editor sends that back, outlined, wrong POV. <laughs> so, I had to go back in and fix that. But I did. there were some good lines in there that I moved over to his chapters. So, I hope that the, the readers like that aspect, getting to see some of that story from Link's perspective. Is that something that will change in the future books, or were the future books already dual POV? <laughs> Some as, as I got further in, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I did with that first one that I did it just from Chris's POV, but whenever I got into the second book, which is kind of sort of a prequel because it goes back before Gave for Pay, and it's the story of the three men that run the online porn company. So it goes back and tells the story of how the initial two met and they were a long-term couple. And then this other guy comes into their life and then working him in. So that book shows all three of their perspectives. And then going forward, it shows the, the different couples. But for whatever reason, when I first wrote Gay for Pay, I just wrote it from Chris's POV. Mm -hmm. Maybe because it was supposed to just be one book and be done. <laughs> Maybe that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely took on a life of its own. And now you've got two additional books planned. Had it always been planned to be a nine book series or as you revisited, did it expand to that? Or? You know, I had never put a number on it before. I just feel like, so I was sitting down whenever I was going through and mapping out what changes I wanted to make and what I wanted to add to each one of these stories. Because back about September, October of last year, i downloaded all the audiobooks and went and listened to the audiobooks because I didn't have the time with everything else going on to read back through them. So I, I listened through book five and then read the others and outlining the story. It was like, okay, so there's this one storyline that I have to tell because so many readers have asked for these two characters book. And then I need a wrap up. I want, it sounds odd, but <laughs> Almost like Harry Potter at the end, you got that 19 years later chapter. Mm -hmm. So the last book, it's not, it's going to kind of go over several decades with all of the characters showing over time where they ended up, what they ended up doing, who they ended up with, etc. Who, who's now married, who has kids, you know? So that last book is going to be and my, my editor is fighting me on the title. Tentatively, I've named it Happy Ever After, and she's like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so we, we'll we figure it out. <laughs> well, at least we know now it's, it'll be locked in here on the podcast what it was going to be if it doesn't get to be that later. 
Yes, true. But it sounds like a nice, fun, almost reunion type movie, almost, you know, if you were talking TV, that everybody got back together to make the reunion. Yes, I was thinking about making it like over the holidays of different, over 10, 15 years, making it so it's this couple's chapter and this is happening over Thanksgiving. And then you've got this couple's chapter and it's happening over the next Easter, you know, jumping with each one th over the years. So you're not only seeing their story and how it ended up, but you're seeing their perspective of this other part of their world. That's going to be very That's fun for the fans fun. of the of the series to to get to that book. Yes, I hope so. Should people who have already read these books and and, and loved these books pick up these new versions? Definitely. Definitely. Especially early on because like I said, Gay for Pay is probably it's got I think over 10k new words added for the word count new chapters, new content. It's been heavily re-edited. And like I said, the core of the story is still there. That's not changing, but the curtains are changing. So mm -hmm. I would, yeah, most definitely suggest anybody that's read it to pick, to grab this one. You mentioned the 10 K ish in, in gay for pay. Do you think the other books are going to have similar changes to that level or is it going to be book to book just seeing what you, what you want to do with them i'm pretty sure that the next book fame and fortune will also have a good bit of new content just because in the past when readers read that book they always said that there were certain parts of the story that they wanted to see more of so i will i will go back in and give them that more that they want so that one will probably change significantly as well and then when we hit book three i'm not sure they all do honestly need seriously cleaning up and re-editing and stuff because like i said hope and i both have just gotten so much better over the years individually and as a team so there's some changes and stuff that need to be made but definitely book two will have a decent amount of changes and then book six will change a lot as well because I kind of screwed up and put nicknames for the two main characters that were so similar that readers often commented in their reviews. I had a hard time figuring out who's who. So that has to be changed mm -hmm. as well. But the other books definitely re-edited, cleaned up, there's going to be some new content in every one of the books. I mean, I, that wouldn't be fair to anybody to re-release the books and it just be the same thing, you know, just changing words here and there. So every book is going to have some new content. How much, I won't know until I actually dive into that book. Now, coming this summer, after you started getting some of these new books out in Stories from the Sound, you've got a brand new project that's going to launch too. What could you tease I us do. about that? So... Anybody that's in my reader group will already know about Chaos Magician. It's a new series that I'm working on that is paranormal with, well, it's kind of a cross between paranormal and supernatural. It's got witches and mediums and psychics and all that different kind of stuff. There's, a, a, it's going to be at least a couple of books. I'm not sure exactly how many yet. I'll have to get writing on it. I've got probably 15K of it written. It's just, it was starting to get hard to write it and I was starting to try to force it. So I decided to just move it aside for a little while, but I'm definitely going back to it. it the cover for that one's amazing too. Uh, I, I was shocked. It was actually a pre-made. I was just rolling through some sites because this was about a year ago, whenever I was first toying around with the idea of redoing all the Alcocks. And then the very first series I wrote, the Opposite series, I pulled that a year ago and I'm going to go back and do the same thing that I'm doing with the Alcock stories for that series next year. Yeah, because that was the first books I wrote. Oh, gosh, they're horrible. But anyway, <laughs> so I was going through all of these different Facebook groups with cover artists and stuff and going through all the different covers, trying to see, okay, would this one work for this? Would this one work for that? And I stumbled upon this cover. And when I saw this image, I was just like, I have to have that. And I have to write a book for it. And I had been 
jotting down notes for Chaos Magician, not knowing yet what the title was going to be, not knowing exactly what the core of this series was going to be, nothing, you know, the models, nothing, just jotting down these ideas. And as soon as I saw that cover, I was like, there we go. That's it. I've got it. So I've had the cover for like nine months. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've had it for a while. It's an amazing cover. So that one, that one will be done sometime this summer. Hope, yeah, I want I want to have that one in paperback when we uh, get to DRL this year, definitely. What was the inspiration behind that series that you've been taking the notes on it for so long now, and then the cover kind of coalesced for you? Well, that one's kind of twofold. I love the genre. I love, you know, like the Conjuring movies, all of the different shows, Ghost Adventures, Dead Files. I love that whole supernatural and paranormal aspect to things where is your house haunted do you have a spirit angels and demons all of that stuff and then my one of my best friends that passed away october of 2018 he was he was very nearly a chaos magician so when you hear the term you're probably thinking david copperfield magic but a chaos magician is actually more like someone who is trained in reiki someone who's a psychic medium and a psychic knower they possess several different gifts and several different talents and whenever they're working with someone they pull off of what that person needs so if this person needs a psychic medium then they work with that if this person needs another aspect they work with that so they work within the chaos of whatever the situation calls for. That's what a chaos magician is. So that's the the base for that main character is Lush. He's going to, in my mind, offer you so many things to do through the series because he can yeah. do so much. Yeah. And his uh, love interest is a voodoo priest. So. <laughs> oh, so together they might be pretty unstoppable. <laughs> Yeah. So that's been, that was fun to research voodoo and figuring out that a lot of people just assume it's black magic and it's dark and foreboding and, but it's really not, it's not as bad. If, if it is that someone's taken it to a wrong, to the wrong place. So that's been a lot of fun to work with and pull stuff and, I'm writing an, Afri an African-American character for him, of course. He's a voodoo priest. So um, Adrian's helping me a lot with that because there's a lot of aspects of that culture that I don't know. And with a lot of issues in the writing community in the past few years about interracial relationships and writing people of color. And when you do a lot of people do write them, they get it wrong. So I want to make sure that I get it right. So she's going to help me with that aspect of the story. And for people who don't know, Adrienne is uh, A.E. Vi. Yes. Uh, who everyone knows from her multiple books out in the genre. It's very different from the contemporary you're writing in, in stories from the sound. Do you like going back and forth between like contemporary and more paranormal? Yes, I do. At some point, um, I already have a pen name earmarked. Um, at some point, I'm gonna. I have a, a male female story in my brain that needs to be put out there. So at some point, I'm gonna go back and write that. So it 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 is for my brain at least. It's fun to go back and forth and do different things instead of just doing the same thing repetitively. But I can't do them at the same time. <laughs> I, I see some authors that are writing like, uh, okay, so I'm writing three different books. You know, I've got this one, this one, and this one going. It's like, oh, oh no, I can, I can barely keep up with one at a time. <laughs> I'm very much in the same boat. I can only really focus on one project at a time. Yes. Maybe write one and, and work on edits for another, but that's that's the extent of my ability. Yes, because we're working on edits for Gay for Pay right now, and I'm tomorrow I'm actually going to start – outlining um some of the stuff for the next book so i'll be working on both of those at the same time but it's two different things and it's in the same series so anything else you can kind of tease out for us to what might be coming after all of this i mean you've already teased also that of course that the opposite series is going to be re-releasing re in 2021 yes. anything else going on we should know about 
Well, for Audible listeners, when I first released Gave for Pay on Audible, I used just a, a narrator that I found. He did a decent job for the book, and it's actually still my highest selling audiobook, is that one. But my goal is with all of these changes and that contract almost being up that Joel Leslie, who narrated the other books that are out on Audible, to have him go back and record that one. So then readers and listeners will be able to start their journey with the same narrator mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. through. So that's are a little you, tease. Are you going to have Joel do the updates as you're reworking the book so that the Audible files update to those as well? That is our goal. We've Excellent. we've actually been chatting about that, trying to figure out exactly how to do it because, and, and you wouldn't even know. It's it's just like he sends me back this email with all this stuff in it. So when he initially recorded these books, he was in a different sound studio. Now he has a new studio with a different sound. So he's like, we need to figure out how I would go and record this chapter, and then you're going to stick it in the middle of the book, and they're going to sound completely different. So just little mm. little things like that that we have to think about, you know. Oh, interesting oh. problem on the technical side. I'm yes. sure Joel will get it solved. I have absolute faith in him. Oh, yes. It, yeah. But him and Rich are like unstoppable. They're amazing. And then the, the series title again is going to be a little bit of a hiccup for Audible. So I've got to figure that out as far as Whisper Sync. But that's something that we want to get ironed out. And I hope to have that out. And of course, it'll be later, much later in the year because Joel is crazy busy and he's got a schedule that's booked months and months and months in advance. So it'll be later in the year before that happens. Cool. But great to know that, that uh, reworking the Audible titles is right up there on the list to do also. Yes. And what's the best ways or ways for people to keep up with you so they know when all this stuff is happening? I say my website, authortmsmith.com. But mostly I do have my Facebook page, Author TM Smith, and then my group on Facebook, TM Smith's Tribe. That is a really good one to follow, to come and join. I do exclusive excerpts. I share my schedule there. I do polls there. What, what kind of books would you like to see? What kind of storylines? I do exclusive giveaways. A lot of, I've moved a lot of what I do over to that group and taking it off of the blog because the blog was so broad spectrum and I wanted, I wanted to be able to reach mostly my readers. So mm -hmm. if you go to Facebook and just type in TM Smith tribe and then come join Twitter, TTC books and more, I think is Twitter. And then Instagram. I try to keep those updated at least weekly. So, but the most current you're going to get is on Facebook. Fantastic. We will link up to all of that. And of course we'll have the pre-order for the all new version of Gay for Pay in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for coming and telling us all about this great stuff that you're working on. Of course. Thanks for having me. This week's interview transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the author interview for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. And thanks again to Tammy for coming and telling us about all the work that she's doing to bring this series back out. And I'm particularly interested in the Chaos Magician series. That sounded ridiculously fun, and I look forward to when she gets those books out, too. Definitely. Okay, guys, I think that's going to do it for this week's show. Coming up next week in episode 232, we've got a special supersized episode involving none other than TJ Klune. Yes, I had an extended talk with TJ, and we do cover everything you're going to want to know. Of course, top of that list is the March 17th release of The House on the Cerulean Sea. Plus, we talk about the May release of The Extraordinaries. And of course, we're going to talk about the August wrap-up for the Green Creek series, in which he actually gives us a couple of spoilers, too. Nothing too big, but it's definitely going to be stuff you're going to want to hear. Yeah, not going to want to miss that. So guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. New episodes of this show are available every Monday wherever you get your podcasts. You can help support this show with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For more information about joining our community and the bonus content we deliver, check out patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. I'm Kurt Graves. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.